For most of its existence, East New York has been on the edge. The edge of Jamaica Bay, the edge of Brooklyn's map, the edge between poverty and prosperity. But now it is right at the center of Mayor de Blasio's plan to create affordable housing. A proposal to rezone East New York has just started its way through the city's public review process and is generating plenty of controversy about gentrification, displacement, industrial jobs, and more. Here to talk about the situation are Abigail savage Lou, who has covered East New York for City Limits for years. Hi, Abby. Hi. Dharma Diaz, an organizer with the Coalition for Community Advancement in East New York. Welcome, Dharma. Thank you. Welcome. And Moses Gates, the Director of Planning and <coughs> Community Development at the Association for Nonprofit Housing Development. Thanks for coming, Moses. Thanks. Uh, so, Dharma, East New York is a wonderful neighborhood for those of us who have visited it, but a lot of folks watching this or hearing this probably haven't. You've been there for a while. What makes it special and different among Brooklyn neighborhoods? What defines East New York? East New York is, um, Cypress Hills is within East New York within itself. I moved into the neighborhood in 1979. It's always known as the North and the South. The, the North End has been high, um, low density, highly populated, as to where the South End has been highly populated, large buildings, out of economic development. That's pretty much who we are, diverse in culture and, and ethnic groups. Why do you like it? I like I like it and I love it. You know, it's 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 I, I moved in from Williamsburg to the Bushwick and, and I just see that the trend continues. It's what not to like. Um Cypress Hills East New York have the J train runs smoothly. We have many mom and pop shops. It's it's the go to community. We definitely have a large Bangladeshi community that's come in. The Asian community is also growing. It's definitely our, our Mecca. Cypress Hills, East New York is, is, is the place to be, quite frankly, between the mom and shops and the easygoing people in the crowd, and education is getting better with time, and now with this, with this boom that we're about to get, who will leave Cypress Hills, East New York? It's definitely <laughs> the place to be. A little tension right now, but we're good. A little bit. Well, let's get into that. So, Abby, we know that there is tension about this plan, but let's talk about the plan itself. What is the mayor and the City Planning Commission, uh, City Planning Department, proposing to do in East New York? Absolutely. So the mayor wants to change zoning codes in East New York to allow for greater residential development. And part of that is because uh, the city has identified vacant or underutilized land in that neighborhood and thinks that it would be a great and um, and inexpensive place to develop affordable housing. Um, and though, you know, it must be added that um, there will be uh, market race housing is part of that um, proposal as well. Um, the city is really proud of this plan because they don't just see it as, um, as a rezoning plan, they see it as a neighborhood revitalization plan. So um, noting, for instance, that, uh, that there's a lot of unemployment in East New York, they're, uh, saying, they're, they're touting this also as like an economic development plan. Um, new uh, large-scale uh, buildings will have ground floor retail, which will bring jobs. They're saying that the plan could bring in um, uh, almost 4,000 jobs, mostly in retail. And they're also uh, touting different things, like in terms of revitalizing streets, um, new, making streets safer. Uh, and But basically, the, the rezoning part is um, they would leave most of the side streets the in their current zoning, um, preserving the residential character. But the main boulevards, like Atlantic Avenue and Fulton Street and Pitkin Avenue and Liberty Avenue, would be upzoned so that um, there could be, uh, on Atlantic Avenue, there could be uh, buildings as high as 14 stories, 12 to 14 stories. Um, right now, Atlantic Avenue is mostly um, auto use commercial as well as some light manufacturing uh, zonings. Uh, so that would definitely shift the character to uh, sort of pretty, like, pretty high uh, residential with uh, ground floor retail as well as commercial buildings like large-scale commercial buildings, um, you know, where you could have department stores and that kind of thing. And the other major boulevards as well, like Pitkin, Liberty, um, Fulton, not quite as high as Atlantic, but also um, uh, higher residential. Yeah. And, that, and that higher residential density is yes. part of the math to permit this affordable housing. And, and obviously there's a citywide angle to this too. Simultaneous to the East New York plan coming out was the citywide mandatory inclusionary housing proposal, which is a mouthful. Tell us what yeah. that means. So mandatory inclusionary housing essentially means that in the future, if you upzone an area, if you allow for taller and denser buildings, 
a portion of that has to be set aside as affordable housing. And the city has come out with a variety of different options, and it's still being debated. City Council still has to weigh in on it. We still have to kind of formulate the, the final plan. Uh, but the part that's kind of being missed is this only works if you have a really strong housing market. You know, you have to have rents or sales prices that are, you know, pretty, pretty high in order to cross-subsidize the affordable housing. Uh, and the city has really announced only rezonings in, in poorer areas so far where the market can't support this. You know, in East New York, you don't leverage any of additional affordability out of the density right now. Uh, it costs money to build housing, affordable housing in East New York. It costs city subsidy, and so if you increase the density, all you're ultimately doing is increasing the amount of city subsidy that needs to go into it. Uh, so as a result, the housing plan for East New York over the next few years doesn't really rely on the mandatory inclusionary zoning. It relies more on uh, city housing programs and city subsidy. And if you want to really leverage the market into affordable housing, you have to upzone areas that are wealthier and have stronger housing markets. Uh, doing it in East New York, Jerome Avenue, even East Harlem and downtown Flushing, which have a little bit stronger market, you know, that's not going to do it. The city has to really start looking hard at wealthier communities to upzone for affordable housing. Let's go back to East New York, Dharma. Yes. Uh, do you feel that the neighborhood needed a plan? Was this something that you were hoping this, to see, and it's a question of what's been proposed? Or tell me about how you came I to this process. I definitely agree that we needed a plan. We definitely have a housing shortage. That's what I doubt. We have many of our two-family homes that, with illegal conversions. We have two and three families living in one unit. So do we need a plan? Yes. But we need a reasonable plan. This is not reasonable. Right now, what we're looking at is at displacement. Currently, the city is saying average income is $37,000. And it, that's not the average income for a family in Cypress Hills, East New York. So definitely a plan, yes, but a reasonable plan, as well as was we saying earlier, East New York is not prepared for the rental increase that's going to come into the neighborhood. You know, as I was speaking with Abby earlier, we, so the, the question was, well, what's happening? What's the trend now in East New York for those that are, that are there and not able to pay their rents? They're moving out of state. Mm -hmm. the, th the South or—it's um, really the, the big buzz in, in East New York. Families are just saying, we got to get up and go. And so. you've written about it, the threat of displacement is one that the administration has obviously heard. And something they've tried in a few neighborhoods is to put in place um, workers and resources to protect tenants against mm -hmm. displacement. You've written previously about those efforts in East New York. What does that look like? Is that, is that getting traction? Hmm. Well, it's somewhat controversial. So I would say that um, the city, one of the city's uh, biggest new programs is they've really expanded the uh, amount of money that's going to legal services, free legal services for uh, tenants in rent regulated buildings specifically in these rezoning areas. So for the next fiscal year they are going to have, a, it's going to be a 36 million dollar budget for uh, legal services, um, which includes about two million uh, for uh, community organizations to help tenants connect to those services, as well as another, uh, an additional uh, four or five million dollars that's going to something called the Tenant Support Unit, and that is a um, a new unit of of city hired. Uh, uh, sort of outreach people who are also going to help tenants connect to um, uh, uh, to con connect to legal services, and um, and so that's that's one initiative. Uh, the city has a has a lot of other initiatives where they're trying to uh, like basically pinpoint bad landlords, um, and but I think that there has been um, some. Uh, some mixed response to that because mm -hmm. I think that uh, you have a lot of community groups that are saying um, this new tenant support unit is not uh, a good use of resources. These resources should have gone to community groups who already have existing networks and can, uh, you know, existing relationships with tenants. And um, also, I know that uh, groups such as the one that Dharma is a part of, the Coalition for Community Advancement has called for other sorts of displace, anti-displacement strategies as well, such as um, tax abatements that uh, would um, help small, small, very small landlords of like family homes um, keep their rents low in exchange for an abatement, or citywide provisions that would um, 
that would basically require landlords to get special permits if they're going to do some sort of alteration of the building, uh, and these permits would require them to prove that they that they don't harass the tenants and that the demolition is required for safety reasons. So various groups are putting forth other um, anti-displacement strategies. And this is something we've talked about before in other neighborhoods where, where yeah. affordable housing has been contemplated. And one of the issues, and I think you've blogged about this, is the, the income levels to which affordable housing tends to be targeted, yeah. uh, which is based around the subsidies. Does the mandatory inclusionary, the citywide plan, uh, address that concern at all with the kind of different packages that it's proposed? Uh, not really, actually. So the mandatory inclusionary zoning plan uh, is set to be average at 60 or 80 percent of AMI, depending, or even up to 120 percent of AMI, depending on the option. And what is it, just, what does that roughly translate uh, for a family 120 percent of, of AMI can get up into the six figures for a family of four. Mm -hmm. uh, 60 and 80 percent of AMI is kind of workforce housing uh, at the, you know, high 30s to 50,000, uh, up to 60,000 kind okay. of range. So we're talking about workforce housing at the 60 and 80 percent of AMI, but it's higher than the median income in East New York. It's higher than the median income in Jerome Avenue. It's higher than the median income in downtown Flushing. It's well higher than the median income in East Harlem. And so what you're looking at under the current provisions is 85 to 100 percent of the housing produced under mandatory inclusionary zoning being unaffordable to the local community. I mean, that's not a recipe for economically diverse, inclusive neighborhoods. That's a recipe for gentrification. And to counter this, you need a real strong anti-displacement strategy. And communities have learned that there are two different things. There are promises and there are laws. And if you write an anti-harassment provision into the zoning code, if you pass a law through city council, that's a law that's guaranteed just like the added density is written into law and is guaranteed. If you have programs and promises and you know budget line items for this year, that's great and we applaud that and that's part of a comprehensive strategy, but those are not guarantees. Mm -hmm. And communities have been taken for a ride on promises. Uh, you have the Rheingold Brewery in Bushwick uh, just recently, worked out a deal for affordable housing, sold the site, back to the drawing board. So communities are really looking for legal guarantees for anti-harassment written into the zoning code. That is the number one ask, and that is something the city has been extremely resistant to. You mentioned the history, and obviously Mayor Bloomberg rezoned, I think, like 40 percent of the city. And, yeah. you know, the concerns about affordability were always there. So were concerns about the process, you know, the feeling that it was top down, that it was a fait accompli. De Blasio and his team have asserted that they have tried to take a different approach with planning. Um, they had a lot of meetings in East New York. Do you feel as though there was a difference in terms of community input actually being sought and uh, ingested into the process? Has the outreach bit has been has the outreach improved? It has. Has the mayor sat down with us? No. It's great that we've sat down with his deputies and the line staff, but to get this plan across, it has to be the mayor. We've gotten rhetoric at the end of the day. It's about 16 months into this, and the mayor has still not said this is what it really looks like. And when we speak of, of AMI, I think it'd be great if we can talk about layman's terms and what it really means. Mm -hmm. It means that 30 to 40 percent of your of your household income is going toward rent. So, say an average person that's making a thousand dollars, let's say, who's working at the local Target, mm -hmm. right, is bringing in 217 a week, right? So, let's say of, of the 200 dollars that they're making a week, a good 70 or 60 is supposed to go toward housing. So how is that affordable? Mm -hmm. I wonder, you know, talking about the political process, in a planning debate like this, the local city council person mm -hmm. is supposed to have outsized influence. Have you got a sense of how, you know, your local reps are lining uh, up? Our, our local reps will definitely have been in, in conversation with us. I think they've been as transparent as, as possible. Definitely we're not with them at the table when they would the with the government entities, so one will never actually know what at what the end result's going to look like. But they've been voted into into those positions that they're in, and we're hoping at the end of the day they're going to do what's best for their community. Now, our our community, as Moses was saying earlier, we're financially strapped, so the housing subsidies are going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, the mayor currently has programs that he's allocated, and in conversation with HPD, we've said, what are we going to do with the households that are receiving that monthly income is 
a thousand dollars, so we're looking at twelve, thirteen thousand, twelve to thirteen thousand dollars a year. Or they're saying we can't talk about that mm -hmm. because we can't help. Well, you know what? That's a sad story. So uh, we're in the ULERP process now. Yes. One of my favorite acronyms, <laughs> ULERP. Uh, so what does that mean, Abby or Moses or anybody? What what happens next? What will we see next? And when will this be resolved? So uh, the ULERP process is our our uniform land use review process, and. Essentially, the city comes up with a plan. They issue an environmental impact statement saying this is going to be the effects of the plan. They bring it towards the community board. The community board votes on if they like it or if they don't like it, or uh, a lot of times community boards will say, well, we like it if, or well, we don't like it but. Um, but it's advisory, it's not binding. They take it to the borough president for the same process, then it goes to the City Planning Commission. The City Planning Commission actually has a binding vote on it. Then it goes to the City Council. The City Council has a binding vote on it. And the City Planning Commission and City Council have to agree on the final package. And the way New York City land use politics generally work is the City Council defers to the local council person on anything in their district. So if the local council person so, supports it, City Council usually so will So a bureaucratic too. saga awaits. We'll all be following it. Thanks so much for joining us. Hope you guys come back and talk about it again.